with this, as we're talking about regulation at the moment, the, the, the new sets of regulation that are upcoming um, uh, in the UK as well with the Vickers proposals and, and also the, the, the Basel III proposals we are having, it, it's now up to you in the audience to, to ask the audience question, uh, to, to, so to answer the audience question, which is, um, you've ho hopefully all got your handheld keypads uh, in, your, in your hand, and um, the, the question we want to ask you is, um, will banking reforms actually dam damage economic growth in the UK? So do you think they're going too far and that they're, they're going to damage economic growth? So if you please, yeah, you're all already starting to vote, I can see. So 53% are saying, oh, so it's almost split. As a journalist uh, thinking <laughs> in black and white, I was hoping for a more decisive <laughs> audience, I have to say. But, uh, um, <laughs> I'll just take it as a majority saying, actually, banking reforms are not going too far. and They're not damaging economic growth. Um, maybe I'll start with Julian. Would you agree to that? <laughs> I, I don't think they are. I don't think it's banking reforms. I, I think the really something we didn't anticipate something we teach in finance, uh, but I don't think we thought it was going to be so important, debt overhang. The, the banks are so laden with debt, uh, with very risky debt, they have no incentive to raise equity. I mean, they never did have incentive to raise equity, but that's because of the guarantee. But now, it's not, it, it's, they've got such an overhang of debt that they are rationing credit uh, I was on the Breeden Committee on SME Financing, and I, I, many people actually emailed me or rang me to tell me how difficult it was for them to raise finance, mm. or the costs of raising finance. And I think that uh, it's not the reforms that are uh, the real problem. It is that banks haven't got enough equity They've got too much debt, and this debt overhang problem is, I think, the most serious problem we have in the banking industry today. Th this is not a question of, maybe a question of what we can do, but, but it's, this is not because of the reforms. This is because the banks ha still have too much leverage. So the deleveraging will have to happen either way, right? We will have yeah. to deleverage. Otherwise, we're going to go the same way as yeah. Japan. But and aren't regulators now very clear? You, you've worked for a regulator. Aren't they taking sort of an almost schizophrenic approach now? I mean, we've seen, you know, they, they want banks to raise more capital. At the same time, we, we've seen them in the UK now easing the liquidity <laughs> rules, for, for example, yeah. again. So, so they're sort of... They, they, yeah. they want to eat the cake and have it at the same time. I mean, we, we actually did a cost-benefit analysis of this in the, uh, yeah. insofar as you can, in the ICB report. And what we said is clearly, if, we, if these reforms are put in place, the cost of capital will go up, regardless of Modigliani, Miller and all this, but, but the cost of capital will go up. Therefore, economic growth will be affected in the short term. But however, if, you, you, if that avoids the odd crash, the benefits of, of, of the cost to the economy of those big crashes way outweigh the cost to the economy of growth in the shorter term. But then we also said, because we are in such difficult positions now, we don't think we can increase these, the, these capital requirements straight away, which is why we allowed it in our recommendations to go through to 2019, because it, you know, it's unlikely there's going to be another huge banking crash right now because of people being exuberant. Mm. So we, we didn't mind there being a few years for it to take place. So, that, so we were also schizophrenic. And I think quite rightly so. But so my answer to your, your, your question would be both yes and no. Uh, <laughs> but in the end, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Haven't uh, investors um, been slightly schizophrenic as well? Before the crisis, they've been pushing high return on equity, which in other words meant banks need to be levered to the max in order to achieve a high return on equity because that, <coughs> that's how you achieve a, right, a high return on equity. But and have they learned their lessons? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of too many investors urging banks to take crazy risks, but that might have been the net effect in terms of what, what, what happened at the end of the day. I do think the point that I made earlier that you just referred, I think return on equity is potentially a dangerous 
metric in as much as it focuses, as Julian would say, on the 5% five per five of the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Uh, and there's the, the, the left-hand side has a lot of assets with risk in them, which are not necessarily governed by return on equity calculation. And then it also doesn't take into consideration debt leverage. And so I think if we focus on that as a metric for what a good performance as a metric to guide incentives. And I, I, what hasn't really come out of this, and I'm not sure how many words, how many times the Vickers report used the word <laughs> culture, but I, 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 th I think culture has to be part of this. And it's, maybe it's a, a very challenging struggle, but I think possibly one of the ways you address the, the question of culture is to address the incentives that are put forward to, to banks in terms of banks and bank, bank executives in terms of how they're managing the banks. And I think if we place too much of a premium on return on equity, I think we're asking for the same thing, same problems to happen all over again. I do believe we need to be a bit more philosophical a bit, and think more of economic profitability. <coughs> in other words, return on equity minus, minus cost of equity equals economic profitability. And I think far too little has been thought about in terms of cost of equity, possibly because it, it appears to many as a bit of an abstract concept. But I think it's it's something that we need to think about a bit more rather than just focus on, on returns, which I think is, again, potentially a recipe for disaster. Mm. So um, talking about the culture as well, I mean, it, it, the culture is obviously a big part of it is compensation. Um, have there been the wrong compensation incent incentives in the banking industry and how much of it needs <coughs> to change for... Well, it's, it's difficult to... Sound. <coughs> um, you wonder sometimes... I mean, it, you know, I sometimes wonder... Um, you look at the, the compensation levels that we're not seeing at the moment, but we saw in the past. And I've had lots of arguments with colleagues at different times about this. Is, is, this, people, is this really people's sort of, sort of marginal product? Right? Or, you know, does this reflect a kind of a a market that in some areas is tremendously uncompetitive. In other words, is there some sort of cartel really going on here? It's very difficult to answer this question. Um, um, in some areas, I, I think, you know, I think there have been real cultural problems, I think, in the past. And, um, you know, these are very private institutions, and we obviously know rather little about it. Um, I think um, there is this interesting, there is this interesting um, initiative in the uh, um, in the U.S. Uh, Fed to basically try and make um, data of all kinds on the financial services industry much more widely available, um, and um, that could that could that could actually make in the long run a big contribution because if you think about the kind of the the kind of crisis that as it, as it arose. Um, for a long time, people knew incredibly little about it. There was sort of almost no data, for example, on, you know, publicly available on on, a, on the on the kind of volume of these products, on kind of who was holding them, whatever. It was all private. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think this is quite wrong because you know there are substantial public substantial public interest in these things. Well, isn't the overarching problem, which reflects also in the in the, in, the, in the bonus culture of banks, that that. Um, the financial services industry as a whole, not only the banks, have taken too big a share of the of the, yeah. the economy mm -hmm. and the euro, and that leads again to the point of you know have be banks become too big as well, and are they you know are they manageable because they have become so big? Well, maybe, when Julian wants well, to. Well, what I, I think it's an interesting failure of governance, and I, the, the the head of. Uh, if you, if you like, in an insurance company who's responsible for dealing with corporates. He said to me a year or so ago, I find it strange that no bank has called me up to ask me my opinion of what share of profits should go in bonuses. That is the idea that bank boards should shut out 30 to 40 percent in bonuses without consulting, forget the government, but without <coughs> consulting any shareholder. I, you know, to me, this shows the breakdown, the complete absence of governance. I mean, this is like a large dividend to uh, uh, employees. It's a huge part. And I, I, I think that there should have been some consultation. The idea that Goldman Sachs should decide it's 
bonus pool without reference to any shareholder of whatever size at all, I find incredible. Mm -hmm. So I think they're really, I, th I think transparency is important. That, that may uh, contribute to it. But I think banks, because of atomistic shareholders, only uh, what's the largest shareholding in HSBC? Mm -hmm. Debt holders who only have power uh, when it, there's distress. There has been an ex an absence of external governance mm. on banks. And the boards cannot substitute for owners. Mm. They can't substitute for owners. If they could, the Soviet Union would have worked. <laughs> <laughs> Centralized planning can't work. So did shareholders fail to do their job? George? <laughs> <laughs> Wake up. Uh, That's clearly um, for you. <laughs> well, I, th I, think, I think we're all learning. I mean, yeah. what, I, what I can say is, I think Julian's point, I, I, I'll give you a factoid. In, uh, Barclays in 2002, staff costs were 3.7 billion, dividends <coughs> were 1.2 billion. Ten years later, 2012, Barclays staff costs were 11.4 billion, dividends to shareholders, 728 million. And it's probably like the frog sitting in a pan of boiling water just gets hotter and hotter. And you may not, you, you know, you just don't notice it. But I mean, if you look at it in this 10-year gap, it's, it's, it's really striking. And so, certainly something that we're doing, I, I sit in the ABI's uh, investment committee, and that we've, in, in our discussions with banks, we're increasingly encouraging them to think in terms of a distribution statement. What is, rather than have us as investors be the residual after the staff is taken yeah. care of, then this may be the type of thing that we would vote on in a binding report, for example. What is the allocation between, in a given period, that you know, when you divide up the pie, you need to retain staff, you need to pay them incentives, but how much should go there, how much should go to, the, to shareholders as dividends, and how much should be retained in the business in an era where we need to bolster capitalization and where we need to protect creditors as well. We haven't done, it's, it's, we, we focus on that so little, we focus on the titillating you know, bonus to a, 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 a chief executive far too much. And I think what we fail to do is think about the aggregate impact of remuneration across the bank and, it's, and how that's distributed. And I think that that's something that we can and should take forward. Is that because boards have been um, too self-referential and not in the, there have been not enough people maybe from other industries on banks boards and independent-minded people who would have pushed for such things to be done differently? I, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's hard to say. I, I, I just think that <sighs> banks have had a culture. Yeah. We, yeah. We, this is our payout ratio. Yeah. And this is, we, we, we pay out bonuses yeah. of X percent yeah. of, of re without really thinking yeah. that through in terms of yeah. a distribution prospect. And so I, I think it's just a question of challenging traditional mm. patterns uh, that have existed and perhaps saying that that may not be sufficient anymore. Claire, you have looked at this <laughs> from a, you know, from the Vickers Commission's perspective and you're going on to a board of a bank now as well. I what mean, do you think? I mean, Well, we very deliberately, everyone wanted us to talk about bank bonuses and bank, yeah. uh, and we very deliberately did that. We got it indirectly by saying, um, yeah. if you, first of all, make banks much less risky because you implement these things, then the idea that you can get a rate of return that, you know, I think 14, 15%, it just says you have the wrong model because you're, that's not a safe model. If you're getting those kind of rates of return, that's because you're getting because it's high risk. So clearly there's something wrong. Um, so, so, so if you start to implement these things, and quite naturally some of these, these things will impact on, on bonuses and the whole way structures of, of how people are remunerated. Um, it is clearly an issue and has been an issue and continues to be an issue. Um, so we, did, I just, we just deliberately decided that we had enough shit on our plate. We weren't mm. going to go into that... <laughs> nest of problems on top. <laughs> As we're talking about the uh, Vickers Commission right now, um, we'll maybe go to our next question to the audience. Uh, if you want to uh, get your handhelds ready again, it, um, <laughs> it's, it's basically the, the, the question has been talked about mostly uh, coming out of Vickers is, um, will ring fencing of banks prevent a future systemic bank crisis? So if you, yeah, you already started voting, that's great. <laughs> I hope for a more decisive um, <laughs> outcome of this one. <laughs> uh, the graphics will take care yeah. of that. Uh, in, in that instance, uh, sorry, yeah, I should have said that. Um, um,
not like the Lincoln in, 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 in the, from the European Commission where they um, are planning to ring fence um, uh, the investment banking side. The Vegas Commission has said we want to ring fence, um, uh, correct me if I'm not <laughs> saying this in the right way, we want to ring fence the retail banking side of a universal bank so in that it is shielded basically from the trading operations of the bank. So if, if um, in, in populistic words, if, 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 if the casino of a bank does something wrong, it doesn't affect the, the, the high street uh, version of it. Um, I think we, ah, uh, that's better. <laughs> so, so, okay, uh, so uh, that's Did quite I damning, I would say, Claire. No, I mean, I agree with that, absolutely. Okay. Ring fencing on its own is nowhere near enough to prevent the next crisis. <laughs> it is one of the measures that yeah. kind of would help make things less likely, but that it is absolutely by no means enough. And no. can, can I just, one point, everyone always <coughs> thinks that when we, we talked about ring fencing, that we meant that the retail bank was going to be safe and everyone didn't have to worry about it, and the, uh, the investment bank was going to be the casino and risky. That is absolutely not what we thought, I, we, the, because what you have got in the retail bank is a whole lot of mortgages and deposits, and particularly with deposit pref preference, the residual people are actually quite at risk because if something happens, they are far more likely to face a problem than they are in the investment bank where there isn't anything like that sort of buffer of people who, who are protected before you get hit. <laughs> so we always view the retail bank as absolutely being risky. And so when you made a decision about where to put your money if you are an industrial company, you've got to think very hard about the risks of one versus the other. This is not a safe place to go, and it isn't intended to be, and we absolutely wanted that to be resolved too and allowed to go bust in exactly the same way as the investment bank. This yeah. is so, and people, the way people just discuss it, it always seems to presume that the retail bit is safe and intended to be safe. It's not at all. Okay. <laughs> can I ask Claire a question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can take my chair. The, <laughs> ring, the ring fencing point, I mean, it's, you're obviously focusing on UK banks, and it's, yeah. it's a big world out there where yeah. UK banks are, are big here, yeah. but in the scope of the larger uh, banking yeah. system, yeah. They're, they're medium yeah. sized players at best. So the systemic crisis, I mean, even if the, the British banks behave, it, to me, that, that if the other parts of the world don't go along, mm -hmm. it doesn't really necessarily fix much. So what you've got to do is say what happens, so, so a lot of, we're nowhere near that here yet, but you've got to think very hard about the inter interaction between one bank and another and across borders and, and about the legal situation if one bank goes bust. <coughs> and, I mean, Lehman just pointed out that people didn't understand what happened when a bank went bust uh, because the different legal systems worked quite differently in the US and, 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 and the UK. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to go in to working out what happens when somebody goes bust across the world. And also trying to put barriers into the interactions between one bank and another, wherever it is, so that you, you're putting in firewalls um, so, that they, so that you don't get contagion. Um, so, yeah, of course we couldn't deal with the, the, the whole world. But what is interesting is looking is pretty close to what we did. So having, we, when we started off, Barnier was very, I mean, really quite rude about what we were doing and, and, was, uh, and, ha, and was effectively implying that whatever we did, they were not going to go anywhere near this because of the universal banking model in Europe. It was brilliant and they had no intention of following what we did. And lo and behold, Barnier got Lickenen and Lickenen has pretty much said, do what we've done. Now, the US thinks that for some reason Volcker is enough. And Volcker is, I can't see, understand, and none of us can on the Vickers Commission why anyone thinks Volcker mm. solves any problems, actually. Mm. Um, but the American, you know, there are, but you, you, there's a huge amount of work to be done to make, to put yeah. in firewalls and to make sure people understand what happens when something Maybe goes bust. We'll have to explain that Volcker is basically, I mean, the main thrust of Volcker is saying banks can no longer trade on, with their own money mm. uh, and, and sort of gamble in, with their own money, so st mm. stop proprietary trading. I mean, that's one question. I'm, I mean, that's one thing I'm wondering about is um, it didn't, I mean, is, is, is ring fencing fighting the right battle? You mentioned Lehman Brothers, which wasn't a retail bank. It mm -hmm. was a pure investment bank. Yeah. Yeah. And it had massive ripple effects on the, in, yeah. during the financial crisis. And didn't, it, didn't the Vickers Commission in a way shy away from, from the main question, which is break up the big banks, make them smaller, and stop um, proprietary trading as um, as well. Well, well, I mean, what we said was, was you, you, and just splitting up the banks isn't anywhere near enough. You've got to get to a position where you can let an investment bank go and you can get a, a retail bank go, and there's a huge amount of work to be done before you're anywhere close to be able to do that. Once you can do that, then uh, and the economy will be affected by a big bank going under, but it's not going to destroy the economy because all the because banks are special because they are the engines of the rest of the economy working. 
So you, you can't let a big bank go unless on any, any bit of it unless you know that you can make sure that the economy can keep on functioning despite that. Um, so we, we, we didn't look particularly at what... We did look at it briefly, but what is the right size of bank? And the evidence was that banks should probably be a lot, small, be a, be a lot smaller. Um, that we saw, but we didn't sort of go into that in the report. But there was no evidence that big banks were good. That, that, but there is a there is a there is a kind of <coughs> academic research that tells you, you know, kind of academically yeah. where you might think a right size bank should be. 